the situation that the guys who had the heaviest capital investment per hundred way were the ones that were getting picked off. When we started here, there was roughly 20 guys, all milk in small dairies like this, were it. Yeah. But our leisure time uh, increased quite a bit. Uh, we found out that uh, you could feed quite a bit less and uh, make quite a bit more money, uh, but a lot less work. For 25 years, I chased high milk production. Mm -hmm. Now I don't. You think more in terms of milk per acre than milk mm -hmm. per animal unit. And that's hard to wrap your head around. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to set records for breeding purposes, it might not fit. Mm -hmm. But if you're interested in making money to pay off a mortgage, if you really want to build wealth, real wealth, this is like oil or timber or mining. All real wealth goes back to the soil eventually. Everything else is secondary in industry. Actually, I'm going to say the herd health in general is better if thin cows are healthy. Mm -hmm. um, feeding legs certainly improve. Mm -hmm. um, respiratory diseases are non-existent in an outside environment. Mm -hmm. um, very little mastitis. Not sure that's because of grazing or despite mm -hmm. it. Yeah. The health of the herd when we switched to grazing uh, became better almost overnight. Our mastitis uh, wasn't great in, to start with, and uh, we very seldom have a mastitis case anymore. What I really notice is with the fresh cows, you know, they have all that lunge area on the pasture, and they have good footing on top of that. Cows that might have ended up in a hospital situation, out in the grass, they'll move right back into the mainstream within just a few days because it's, they're just not getting banged up or anything. Uh, cows are, I feel, a lot more healthy. They, uh, they get to roam around and, and eat, and uh, they get lots of exercise being uh, out on grass. Uh, they breed back a lot quicker and uh, easier. Uh, they don't give quite as much uh, milk, but their components, uh, butter, fat, protein, uh, increase uh, with the grass feeding. When you have a lot of cows, they lose some of their herding instinct. Um, for better or for worse, as the herd, we shrink and put it all in just one group again and then put them on the grass, they go back more into a design society with a hierarchy, you know. It's more like it was when I was a kid. Um, I don't know if that's good or bad. Um, they get more independent. They figure things out different. <laughs> they don't need you as much. <laughs> Part of what makes it work so well is that uh, the cows last much longer, many more lactations, and of course then you have more calves. Uh, we actually end up having uh, cattle to sell because of the fact that we can't possibly feed that many uh, with our low call rate. Uh, we average 10 to 15 percent call rate, where most areas are in the 30, 35 percent call rate. So that is one of the ways to increase income on a grazing farm is, of course, sell excess uh, animals. High production, which tends to break udders down over time, is not a problem anymore. <laughs> um, so I expect, and historically, grazers' cows live longer. Oh, much easier. Uh, and I don't know where, where that all comes from. Something about getting them out on the earth again. They eat the ground. It's kind of like you and I eating direct out of the garden. Mm. How do you beat that? You go out, you pick it, you eat it. And I think a little of that is true for the cows. Because I know a lot of times come spring, my cows will paw dirt mm. right on the fence lines mm. and eat it. Mm. As soon as we let them outside, they quit that. Huh. So it's probably because I'm too cheap on the minerals, but you know. <laughs> Surprisingly, I would say it stayed about the same. Mm. Um, but the cows are thinner, mm. which I expect would be negative energy balance, negative impact on reproduction. Mm. Uh, that said, heat displays much better when they're on mm. soft dirt instead of hard concrete. Yeah.
And we breed for fertility. We want the cow to get bred back yeah. on her first time. We've been working for that, and it's in, quite frankly, it's working really well because we have a really high first service conception. We use primarily New Zealand genetics. We like uh, the New Zealand Holstein because it's a smaller animal. It will top out at about 1,100 pounds. They use a lot less feed. Butterfat and protein content are higher. And they're a lot uh, more easy animal to uh, herd, or, you know, mm -hmm. get longer. Mm -hmm. They're friendly. We will be purchasing some Frisians. American Frisians, but they've been both, uh, New Zealand genetics since '93. Okay. And that animal's going to be like a thousand pounds in terms of size. Okay. And they'll be bred true. It'll be like a sub herd. Mm -hmm. We'll have the American Holstein genetics, the Frisian genetics. I don't see us crossing back and forth. Mm -hmm. We are able to be owner operators, mm -hmm. both. And um, I like a lot of quiet. The grazing offers a lot of quiet. I spend a lot of time out there uh, just walking around and changing fences or whatever, which I really enjoy that work. I'd rather do that than a lot of things. Climb silos. Mm -hmm. I really would. Uh, matter of fact, there are some days when I'm out there and you kind of almost feel a little guilty for getting paid to do what you do. <laughs> I mean, that's honestly, we've talked about that. My wife and I are like, we're getting paid to do this today. <laughs> yeah. This is pretty cool. Yeah. Because we enjoy being out in the sunshine, the fresh air, the same as the cattle. Uh, and, and I would much rather be uh, building fence than climbing silos or worrying about bills to pay that I can't pay. Yeah. I could have just a good line of hay equipment, mm -hmm. forget all worrying about getting decent boxes and yep. choppers, and yep. the silos will wore out, the unloaders will wore out. And I'd also had some health issues with the silos. Um, huh. The constant dust and mildew. Yeah. I've been trying to work on my sinuses, but that constant yeah. exposure for, well, I've been going up since I was 11 years old. Yeah. And uh, after 40 years of going up silos, they said, you really need to quit it. Mm -hmm. And so we did. And then I got gassed twice and, and lived through it. Yeah. And, you know, I was, I didn't know what it was the first time. Yeah. I, I thought it was just something I had in my lungs, you know. But you're fine during the day. I mean, you feel a little crumpy. You wake up in the middle of the night, you think a big man stand on your chest. You just can't get air in. Yeah. And uh, finally, they told me what that was. And they say you're not supposed to heal from it, but you do. Yeah. Took, took about six months before you can take a deep breath again. But it does eventually heal. Yeah. But my wife, uh, she really didn't want me to do that anymore. Yeah. Well, our leisure time uh, increased quite a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think it's. I said before I got three kids but all of their own farms and I don't believe if we had not went to grazing that they would have uh, been farming today mm -hmm. because uh, we found out that uh, the benefits of grazing were uh, that you could have a life and, uh, and a family and uh, get, uh, you know, have some fun along the way. Mm -hmm. It really frees you up. My wife noticed one big thing. She says, now that the cattle are out so much, you have time not only to do the row crop work, but you have work time to do maintenance. Where before, when they're in all summer, you still are that clean bed all. Yeah. Yeah. And um, you just, it's nice to have the variety of, you know, in routine. That's nice. Kind of a little different. We feel satisfied in that the neighbors give us a lot of compliments too. And you know, you worry about your perception, that's mm -hmm. another thing you have to be concerned with with any business that's consumer oriented. And um, I can't ever, if the neighbors have a complaint, they're not telling me about it. <laughs> okay, they have a different perception. Um, all the cows calve right here. Mm. And uh, there are days and there'll be car cars lined up when we're calving a lot. <laughs> and they just want to stop and yep. watch the calves be born. Mm. And of course, I live there, so my wife has binoculars right in the kitchen window so she can watch each calving and monitor. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, but, but that's really worked well for the community too. Great. Yeah, 
you have to understand that I had a mindset that was all confinement. Okay, that's just the way you did things. Yeah. Cows couldn't eat anything unless it was alfalfa. You know, yeah. I don't mean to make fun of that, but that just so you understand, it's, it's a long ways from where we're at now. Yeah. It was hard to accept some of that, especially when you're in deep financial. Uh, I wouldn't say trouble, but we were just treading water all the time. Yeah. Basically, your your capitalization cycle was if everything worked out good, you had to pay for it by the time whatever it was wore out. For 25 years, I chased high milk production. Now I don't. If you think more in terms of milk per acre than milk per acre. And that's hard to wrap your head around. One of the uh, things that we have to put up, of course, is with this mud in the spring, and sometimes in a really wet spring that becomes an issue that uh, we have to deal with. Uh, we have uh, some improved lanes, and uh, we have a couple of uh, lanes that aren't improved, and so we try to stay off of them during the wet season. But that, that can be a real issue on uh, some farms. The first year when we put them out, you could see all the tracks, you know, just like a regular alfalfa field. And uh, the cows didn't know what to do out there. They just go out and lay down. <laughs> you know, they yep. did. Until you, the heifers you raised on grass or in the line, you suffer so. Mm -hmm. They just, I don't think even internally, they're designed exactly yeah. like a grazing cow. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they have that depth of rib and, the, and playing the room to handle that much forage right. coming through them. Right. I don't know, theory. And they're not bred for it. We had great big cows like everybody else, you know, and they'd come out here in their knees and and their hocks would get hammered up in the barns and they'd come out here and heal up, but they didn't really graze very well. Yeah. yeah. But um, we just kind of suffered through the first couple of years. I wasn't sure very honestly if we were going to make it. It was mm. close financially. Yeah. Because you have the new investments, right? the old debts. Yeah. Everything you don't know what's together. going on and neither do the cows. <clears throat> and it was dicey. And we had just put all our kids in Christian school. Mm. <laughs> and that was about. That was about $10,000 a year, which we didn't have, but we felt led to go that way, so we did. That's been a lot of challenges. I really didn't, I'm not kidding when I say I didn't know anything. <laughs> I've been on concrete for 27 mm -hmm. years. So all the cow manipulations was a big challenge. Um, learning when grass was ready and when it was done was something I didn't have, I wasn't familiar with. Mm -hmm. And starting with a group of Holsteins that were bred for high production in a confined system. They expect them to walk three quarters of a mile twice a day, mm -hmm. um, and that will take a lot. Mm -hmm. It's a different management system for the cows, mm -hmm. and that really is different. Um, the cow has to learn why she's out there. She really does, and some never will, um, especially the older cows. Best, if I was going to start from, from scratch, I'd go get some calves and raise them on grass. Just be patient when they started milking, that'd be my grazing cows. Hmm. It'd be a lot simpler. Not always possible for a dairyman. You will have to deal with the weather more. It's not much fun out there getting cows in a rainstorm. But there are days like today when it's sun and shining. It's great to be out there. Yeah. Uh, one of the other things that uh, on a seasonal herd when you're calving in the spring, you're having four, five, six calves a day. For that six or eight weeks, uh, you're really, really busy. Uh, here we would uh, check the dry cows two, three times a day, and then uh, Mary Jo would check uh, a couple of times during the night uh, to make sure every, every calf is okay and mom was okay too. So, that, uh, you know, for that six or eight weeks, that, it's pretty intense. But after that, once you get the calves in groups and, and fed uh, in the groups, it's uh, fairly easy. The real early season when the grass grows faster than the cows consume it, and then the late season when it doesn't grow fast enough to, to always have grass in front of them. We had a really easy summer, real timely rains, never had to irrigate. So for a, a novice like myself, it was a pretty easy slide. Mm -hmm. I'm getting started, but you got to start early or else you'll be heavy in a heartbeat. Other grazers, uh, 
Howard Stroke, for example, I've talked to him extensively. And then there's a guy named Ben Bartlett up in the UP that's been a proponent for grazing for a long time. And I did go to a few grazing schools, so I had a clue what to expect. Um, so MSU Extension and then my faculty coordinator. And then we went up to that uh, seminar and some of the stuff made sense and some of it really stretched me. And I was always trying to take what they were doing with grazing and meld it into my confinement precepts, yeah. you know, and it, you kind of come up with a blended mess. And, you know, you, you're trying to fit things together that maybe should. Yeah. I go visit uh, at least two or three, four successful grazers because each one will be quite different and you will learn something applicable to your farm from each one of those operations. And then if time allows, I would design a system with uh, some of those guys help. I get my calves out and I would learn about grass and grazing and they would learn about grass and grazing. And then I'd get my fresh cows out, the cows getting ready to freshen. I get my dry cows out. And that might be all I tried to do the first year. And I'd do that because I would learn and the cattle would learn, but I wouldn't affect my cash flow as it was. My milk cows would stay in and that would all you could only handle so much change at once. At least me. And then uh, the next year perhaps um, I would worry about starting to get my cows out and I would do it with the understanding that perhaps the first year I'd only let them out 12 hours and I would do kind of a quasi grazing and uh, just step into it lightly so as not to send shockwaves through your finances yeah. okay um, but I guess that's what I would do I would just go into it very slow after I had talked to several guys um, if possible So I, I do think things will get better. And most grazers I talked to when they first started, not regretted it, but wondered if they made the right decision. Mm -hmm. So if you stick with it, it will eventually work out. So three years for everybody. <laughs> three years for the cows, three years for the people, three years for the grass. And I think it's true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what is that? What are those two words? Mary Jo. <laughs> oh, I love that. That's on tape, Mary Jo. We have to tear the barn down to why we built the house. You can't believe anything about it. Yeah. <laughs> and this guy is somebody that comes from down the street every now and then bothers me. <laughs> Oh, I love the smell of that one.